if I walk over there and sit next to Mr. Johnson and carry my phone, does Google know that I was sitting here and then I moved over there? I genuinely don't know without knowing well, I'm what shocked you don't know. Uh, I think Google obviously does. Are you familiar with the general data protection regulation by the European Union? I think the fear of what happened with the social media platforms, the fear that people now have of like privacy issues and data mining and all of these things has just led people to find ways to counteract the problems that we're seeing. And a lot of people are turning to media literacy and the media literacy educators and community to be that answer. Um, okay, so first things first, Hand, let's get your folders. It's kind of a new ed enhanced version of literacy, right? So it's really asking the question, you know, what does it mean to be a literate citizen in today's world? The idea is that you're teaching people to not just learn how to read and write, but you're learning, you're teaching them how to be able to negotiate all sorts of media forms. All of our communication tools, all the different types of technology, we have to be able to consume and create using all of them. If you're going to start teaching about reading and writing, you should be teaching about how the digital environment operates. And you know, you should be teaching all of that with an eye towards critical understanding. As students spend more and more time in the digital world, the concept of digital citizenship is seen as an important area of educational knowledge, not only in the United States, but around the world. So digital learning, the general definition, is any type of learning that incorporates technology usage within it. Or a more practical use of digital learning, or how digital learning is more formally known across education, is in the type of practices of teaching kids how to use computers in a responsible and respectful manner. Go ahead and minimize the game so that we can see your code, Maya. And team, let's get ready to share some shout outs and suggestions for Maya. I see several students want to give you a shout out and suggestion. They don't know how to use this technology. And when they get online and you start to use the internet, there's a whole world that's open to them, right? There's so many things that they're exposed to, and there's so many things that they can explore. And unfortunately, without the proper guidance, kids tend to make bad decisions. They tend to not understand how their actions in the internet will affect them later on in their life. A lot of times we have the misconception that because our kids are so exposed to technology that they automatically know how to use it and they know what to do. And that is false. Kids need guidance in how to use the technology just like anything else. As we examine the role of media literacy in the lives of our children, we must also reconsider its position in the lives of our parents and grandparents who've witnessed the drastic shift from a print culture to a social media culture, vulnerable to similar threat. I think that there is something very much to be said about the generational gap of how people have used the internet over time. I remember using Napster as a kid and also understanding like what is above board and what is not. You know, for older generations, and this is what we've seen in a lot of the academic literature, there is more of kind of a susceptibility or vulnerability to um, kind of consuming more of it and then also over time believing it. And that's not to say that older generations are searching for this content by any means, they are being targeted repeatedly. Over 65, that population shared more fake information than any other population during the 2016 election. And I think culturally and generationally, they grew up in a time where, you know, if you read it, it was yeah. true. Right? So I'm gonna rest my finger where it says open seven days a week, mm -hmm. right on the word open, and I'm gonna let go. And now what I've done is... The, the dirty word that nobody wants to use is ageism, right? We live in a society where we have a bombardment of negative stereotypes about people who are older, and we have uh, kind of accepted that somehow we're going to segregate our society on the basis of age. You know, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, seniors and older adults were driving a lot of our community and, and our civic dialogues. So when you went to a, a public meeting or a, a political event, it was 70-year-olds who were often the people that had the experience and the confidence to speak out on policy issues. But today we've had this sort of moment where all of those dialogues have shifted online and a lot of the tools and environments that people are using are now digital. The speed at which technology changes 
um, puts a challenge on us as a population and as a society to continue to educate people outside of formal education. So the question is, how do we how do we teach? You know, how do we deal with that divide because it's there. You mean this? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought that was the back. I read. I learn how to do things that I'm interested in. If I'm looking for news. I go to look for news stories that I'm interested in. I use it, you know, for my daily life. Pulling that right handle either to the right and down what we need today is to get seniors trained and empowered and included in the digital uh, conversations about our country and our community's futures so that they can bring those perspectives back in. I think that a lot of media literacy education is focused on messages and the importance of interpreting messages and being mindful of the messages that you create. Or her claim is that we perceive the printed word as more credible than the visual text. Do we agree with that? One of the reasons I love media literacy, I love teaching media literacy, I love talking about media literacy, is because it is so broad and there's so many different ways to practice it. But of course, that makes it hard to scale, right? Because I can't just go into a school um, district and say, this is the way you have to do media literacy. Um, with that said, though, the fact that it is adaptable, the fact that it can be flexible for different communities in different contexts is a positive. When we're online, we already have the notion that a lot of things are like fake news or like not every, we can't like trust what we see online. Okay. But when it comes to printed, I feel like there's so many people that look over it over and over and over again before it gets printed. So I feel like, I guess it's, it may not even be 100% true that printed has more accurate news, but I think it's a perceived notion that it is. It's a very interesting point that you just made. The process that something like this goes through to get to print versus the ease at which we can share information online, I think it's, a, it's an excellent point. The challenges of scaling media literacy often kind of show up in this idea of, oh, teachers have too much to do. Teachers that are, you know, in elementary school or middle school or high school in the United States have so much on their plate that you can't also, on top of it, give them media literacy to teach. So the way that we frame it is media literacy is a way to teach, it's not a subject to teach. What's been so interesting about the fake news conversation and the misinformation and disinformation conversation is that we're making an assumption that the problem is the misinformation and disinformation. The problem is much broader than that. Even if we eliminated everything that's fake, even if, if Facebook could magically, you know, make all the disinformation disappear, we would still need media literacy. We still have so much to understand. We, we should have always been asking questions. This program is made possible with support from Connecticut Humanities.